with the world of comic books and pop culture ever changing. How are fans meant to keep up with the trends in the industry? Is the new event from the big two worth reading? What's the story on that show from that network about that hero from that comic book? Can I trust a movie review from someone who hasn't even read the source material? We have the answers you seek. These are my Big Fat Pull List's current issues. Welcome to another edition of Current Issues. Our top stories for this episode include Turning the Lights Off over at Marvel with Dark Ages. Seeing how things are going at DC with Infinite Frontier. Getting a review of the Netflix adaptation of Sweet Tooth. Taking a look at the source material inside Why the Last Man. And sharing thoughts on the news of Jonathan Hickman leaving the X-Men. I'm one of your hosts, Mr. X. Joining me this evening are... Dr. Impact. I'm Smurfy. Dragon is Prime. And reporting live from the streets, it's Marv Danger. Spoiler warning. From this moment on, spoilers are in effect. In the show notes for this episode on our website, we will have listed the time code for each of these segments. So... If you do not want to be spoiled by something that we're talking about, just skip ahead, go watch, read, or do what you have to, and then finish the episode later. You have been warned. Marv Danger live on the scene. What happens when the world you know is changed irrevocably forever by one small man? That's right, folks. I'm talking about Marvel's Dark Ages. To follow through on my basic bitchness for post-apocalyptic books, we've got Dark Ages. I saw it on the shelf, and I thought, interesting, let's see what this is about. And I skimmed a couple pages, and then I did something I normally don't do unless I I don't really feel like I'm going to pick it up, is I flipped to the last page to see what the gotcha is. Mm. And uh, the gotcha of this is... And then comes the apocalypse. And it's essentially a splash page of a lot of the tech heroes and Miles Venom. And it's real interesting. So now let me backtrack as to why that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Before before you even get into that, because I I was curious about picking it up. I I obviously I did. I didn't. So I'm I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about it all. Um, the the biggest reason I didn't get it was because I could not find anywhere online a straight answer as to whether this was in continuity or out of continuity. Because if it's out of continuity, I'll just pick up the trade. What is the answer there? I couldn't find the straight answer online anywhere. Well, let me give you my answer, and that is not in continuity. Mm. What I looked at online too, because I did a little uh, Google research as well, and I found it was not in canon. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. All right. So sorry. Okay. Now that we've cleared that up, continue. Well, it's also one of those stories that was delayed as well. It was supposed to have come out months ago. Right. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Thanks to my financial uh, research, I have determined that this is definitely a book worth picking up. Mm. The trades will probably be super sweet. But um, I don't know. I don't like waiting for trades on something like this. What happens is it's a normal day and uh, Peter Parker, MJ, their daughter are hanging out with Luke Cage, uh, Jessica Jones, and uh, everything's fine. And then out of nowhere, like it it flashes to Peter having a huge spider sense, so much that it causes him pain. Uh, Same with his daughter. And then it shows the spider people around the world also having this issue. And it's because they know what's coming. And what I like about this, because it's not in continuity, because it can, it's just its own, like, its own enc- encased universe, they can pull a lot of different characters that they just normally wouldn't. So uh, Moon Girl shows up with Devil Dragon, Fantastic Four there, x 23s there, like, all these people are here, and because it's not in continuity, it's not like a extravaganza, make sure you pick up 
DX23 one shot where it's whatever she's doing or the, you know, moon girl and devil dinosaur one shot. It's all very nice. And what you find out is that a long time ago in a galaxy, very, 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 very close earth, there was a being created to stop uh, entropy and consume black holes. Eventually he became corrupted because it was matter. It was destroying matter. Black holes, you know, destroy. So he was created to protect. Eventually he is corrupted after centuries and he becomes the unmaker, something like that. And he got so bad that the living tribunal had to essentially shut him down. Well, now he's waking up again. And there's kind of hints that Apocalypse might be the one doing the waking because Apocalypse is essentially a technopath. And so he wants that power. So what do, the, what do Earth's Mightiest Heroes do? They send in a small elite force to try and contain this guy. It's The Thing, Sue Storm, Doctor Strange, Wanda, and Vision. And it doesn't go well, my guys. They succeed but ultimately all die but one. Ben Grimm takes the first swing and he is immediately unmade. Sue Storm holds the bubble up while Wanda tries to create and change reality around him. But as soon as she does that, he literally unmakes it. He unmakes her. Then Vision's up and Vision has lost it because he just saw the woman he loved die. So he dives straight into his head and he's able to buy them enough time for Strange to look through all the universes and find one universe where there is a constant EMP, essentially, pulsing through. And because he is a living robot, Strange taps into that dimension, opens the gate, and then hits it with it. And it's successful. Before that EMP can fully finish the job, the Unmaker stabs Strange through the heart with a giant spear of his own body. Strange dies, saving Sue Storm and sending her back to Earth. Unfortunately, upon his death, that portal stays open. And so the world is slowly covered with EMP waves, and it knocks out everything. There's scenes of Iron Man falling from the sky, Viv being just laid out because she is a being of that kind. Currently, Giant Man is in giant form. But now his stuff doesn't work anymore. Pin particles aren't electric, but what uses them is Spider-Man's web shooters as you see him fall. And from here, it's kind of, we're kind of told the rest of the story through the eyes of Peter Parker. Essentially what we come back is that was all Spider-Man telling us the story around a campfire. Seven years have since passed since that happened. And now comes the apocalypse. Um, in the preview for it, you can kind of tell it's going to be a steampunk world. Uh, Iron Man is very steampunk-esque in his new look. Whether it's Tony Stark or not, we don't know. Mm, Spider-Man yeah. seems to have steampunk-styled web shooters. And then, like I said, there's um, the Hulk is there, Beast is there, Reed is there, and a few others. So I am super interested to see where it goes. You know, if you know me, I stuck through Wonder Woman, Dead Earth, and this seems to be a lot fucking better already. Uh, well, and I can understand because you're you are you do have a penchant for the post-apocalyptic type stories. I will not be picking it up. I will wait until the trades because there's just too much going on right now in the world of comics, and if I get sucked into all of it, I'm not going to have money to eat. <laughs> or or pay the mortgage. That's yeah, fair. yeah. I can also just loan you them as I get them. Well, this is true. I uh, I picked up the first issue as well. Yeah. And uh, I will have to agree 100% with what Pistol was saying. I think it was a hell of a lot of fun to read. Um, my biggest thing was going into it first was reading and going, holy crap, is this canon? Is this really happening? And then I found out it's not really canon, but it's still a super fun story. Right. Once once all the different heroes started showing up, I'm like, this isn't canon. And then yeah. uh, like because again, you can't get away with that in a not in a canon style book. Like mm -hmm. you can't just have X Men show up in the Fantastic Four without also, you know, the list in the back of the book saying, Don't forget to pick up yeah. the lists of fucking one shots. 
sure. Right, right, absolutely. Did you pick up Dark Ages? And if so, what did you think? Tag us on any sort of social media we're on and let us know. And now, Dr. Impact will be bringing us all of the news from the folks out on the front lines of Infinite Frontier. Infinite Frontier, yeah, I'm going to talk about the, the miniseries itself. Yeah, we're going to get into that, and, and I guess the one-shot as well. But more so than that, Infinite Frontier, I also kind of want to touch on the entire branding of it. So for those mm -hmm. of, of you out there who are listening who don't maybe, for whatever reason, know what in the world it is I'm talking about, after the Flashpoint, DC rebooted everything and started over again with the New 52. Mm -hmm. People didn't like it. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, many of us included. And so I think it was around, what was it, 2013 or 14, somewhere in that area, I think. They kind of got rid of the whole New 52 thing and started DC Rebirth. Mm -hmm. And Rebirth led up to Death Metal, which just uh, just finished oh, I don't know, what, six, seven, eight months ago, something like that. And now the new branding for DC is called Infinite Frontier. What is Infinite Frontier? How does this make things different um, from anything that's come before? Basically, the events of death metal were orchestrated in such a way that now writers and creators can tell any story they want about any character set in any timeline on any alternate world, and it's all canon. Everything counts. Everything is acceptable because what Infinite Frontier is, it is no longer a single universe. It is no longer a 52 multiverse. It is no longer an infinite multiverse like it was for Crisis. It is a infinite omniverse, I think is what they're calling it. And basically, basically what that means, it's a multiverse of multiverses. Is all it really is. That's all Infinite Frontier really is. There, there is a world out there where the crisis never happened, and the pre-crisis world continued on with their multiverse still intact. And there's a world out there where that occurred, but Parallax and Extant never did what they did in Zero Hour. And so that multiverse is instead. And so it's basically any writer can come in and do anything they want at any time. Out of this comes a six issue miniseries called Infinite Frontier. The most interesting thing about the book is that it focuses on a team called Justice Incarnate. And Justice Incarnate is essentially a Justice League made up of members from various different worlds throughout the multiverse. Hmm. President Superman is the Superman on the team. I forget the world that the Aqua Woman is from, but she's there. Captain Carrot is a part of it. There is a, <laughs> um, oh yeah, he's, he's fun. There is a character called Machine, uh, Machine Head, I think is his name. And he is essentially from an, an Earth in the DC universe that is a an Avengers uh he's basically like like Marvel has the Squadron Supreme as their answer to the Justice League he comes from a world where there's their answer to the Avengers ah. and Machine Head is kind of their Iron Man in in a in a very loose sense and Barry Allen from Earth 0 from our Earth um is is the representation there he's their Flash well, when this series starts, a rocket crashes on the Ellis's farm. And the Ellis's, that's the family that raised President Superman on Earth 23, I think it is, something like that. Anyway, a rocket crashes. And at first I thought, oh, I guess we're going to get a little backstory. But no, this is modern. President Superman is already president. There is yet another rocket that has crashed at the Ellis's farm. And when the rocket opens, it's Flashpoint Batman oh. in the rocket. Yes. Who has not been seen since the events of the Bane uh, War? I can't remember if he was in Death Metal or not. Oh, okay. Because there was so much going on, but certainly at least Bane, yeah. He was in City of Bane. I remember I remember that. Absolutely, he was there, yeah. I can't remember if he showed up in, in, in Death Metal or not, but um, 
yeah, he shows up. It turns out that I guess if I'm reading this <laughs> this thing correctly, and whenever you get into multiverse stuff with DC, as we all know, it gets very confusing. Mm-hmm. If I'm reading this correctly, I think that even though the multiverse exists, the Flashpoint universe no longer does. Mm. I believe that that is one that is gone. So he is a, like a man without a, a home, essentially. And he doesn't really know what he was doing in the ship. He doesn't really know why he was shot down, why he crashed or whatever. And so Justice Incarnate, they work with him to to try and figure it out. Meanwhile, there is another group in the Zero universe, in Earth Zero, called the Totality. And the Totality is a group of uh, both heroes and villains who work together to try and figure out and sort of map what what changes have occurred as a result of the most recent crisis. Because most people remember everything now. Mm-hmm. Most people remember that they that the world has been rebooted a number of times. And not just most people as in most heroes. Regular civilians know. Everyone knows about the multiverse. Everyone remembers. And it's causing a lot of problems, and there's a lot of fear from civilians. Like, well, wait, not only do we have to worry about aliens and supervillains here, but now we have to worry about an infinite number of multi-whatevers out there that can come at us. Well, then um, you also have, have in some of the DC books I was reading, uh, before the end of Death Metal wrapped up and Infinite Frontier started, uh, there were characters who were remembering, they had memories from all these other... mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lives that they lived and they were trying to figure out well what what really happened and what didn't happen or what what matters and what doesn't matter anymore yeah and so yeah so the totality is kind of there to to kind of try to make sense of all of that and i forget now off the top of my head who's all in the totality but i i think lex Luthor is a part of Of it of course he is well of course and um (laughs) i think vandal savage is a part of it of course Um, he is uh alan scott is a part of it um didn't savage die in justice league if he did, you may have spoiled that for me because I'm not caught up on Justice League. <laughs> it was like the first like four or five issues. Yeah, I'm not that far. <laughs> it's okay. It's not. I'm not no, always no, no. fine. I'm not, I'm not talking the Bendis run. I'm talking oh. Rebirth. Oh, it doesn't matter. People that died before that, everybody's back. Roy Harper's everybody's back. back. Oh, Every, yeah. Okay. So anything that happened pre Death Metal, none of that. That doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> because now everybody's back because that doesn't count because everything counts. Yeah. Follow me. Right. No, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good. <laughs> you know, and, and it's and it's fairly interesting. I, I can feel like reading this this six issue miniseries, you know, a lot of this is leading to I think the relaunch of the Justice Society is what it feels like. Because uh the Justice Society seems to be uh sort of scattered. And Obsidian goes to Alan Scott and tries to to get him to help him find Jade because they can't find Jade. And uh, and so you know there's a lot of stuff dealing with that. Meanwhile, President Superman and and Flashpoint Batman are trying to figure out what exactly is going on there. While all of that is happening, Barry is sent to investigate things and try to figure out is any of these issues, these random things all connected. A- and Barry ends up inadvertently ending up on one of the two new never before seen worlds. Always a flash fault. The new worlds are Earth Omega and Earth Elseworld. Earth Omega and Earth Elseworld. Right. We don't really know what these two worlds are just yet. I mean, we can pretty much kind of figure out earth elseworld i mean it sounds like it has something to do with the elseworlds but um but we don't really know what these worlds are well he ends up inadvertently on earth omega and when he's there he's essentially kidnapped by a souped up super powered version of the psycho pirate Ooh, well yes and he is imprisoned in what is essentially a giant cosmic, for lack of a better word, 
hamster wheel, I guess. And he's forced mm-hmm. to run on, on this giant wheel. The other issue with all of this is Roy Harper is back. And he's running around. But he's not just back by himself. He is back, and he has discovered he has a Black Lantern ring hmm. on his hand. That's interesting. That he cannot fully control. But when he uses it, that's when he turns all zombified. If he doesn't use it, he's just regular Roy Harper with the ring on his hand. And he doesn't understand what's going on. But he's seeing visions of things. And one of the visions he saw is a vision of Earth Omega. And he found out who is the sole... Well, I guess not anymore with Psycho Pirate and Barry there. But essentially, who is the sole inhabitant of Earth Omega? And it's Dark Side. <laughs> it is Dark Side's prison almost, for lack of a better term. That makes sense. What is this all going towards? Obviously, I think it's building towards a relaunch of the JSA, but the other thing that that I'm getting from this is it feels like it's building to another crisis within the next year or so. Now, I love crossovers, and I love DC crisis events. I always do. But one thing that made Zero Hour so cool when I bought that was that it had been five years since the crisis. Yeah. One thing that made infinite crisis so cool was that it had been God at that point, what was it? 10 or 15 years since zero hour. Yeah. You know, and even, even the flashpoint and metal, there was at least a couple of years in between now between metal and death metal, you're talking what a year and a half, maybe two years tops. Okay, fine. I went with it because you were still in the process of trying to get us back to cleaning up the mess of, of new 52, but now here we are and we're going to do it again. I I love me a crisis, but don't give me another crisis next year. Give it to me five years from now at the very least. That's my one issue with this whole infinite frontier push. All the books are good. You know, that I've read, it's all very interesting, especially the Infinite Frontier miniseries, but but just, can we just take a breather from the crisis after right. crisis after crisis? That's my biggest issue with all of it. So yeah, for a new reader just coming in, man, I'm sure that this is probably pretty exciting. And I don't want to, as the kids say, yuck your yum. What kids say that? What kids are you hanging out with? You're an adult. <laughs> Better question. Yeah. Apparently, it's a apparently it's a phrase. Apparently, that's a thing. Yuck! You don't yuck my yum. I don't want to do that to to people who are who are getting into it and they're really enjoying it because it is kind of a fun story. It's just really we're gonna do this again. So that's kind of where where DC's Infinite Frontier is. It's um it's it's better than the New Fifty Two stuff. I don't find it quite as exciting as Rebirth, only because I feel like we're just kind of rehashing. Yeah. And the whole initiative, the Infinite Frontier initiative, there are very interesting things in there. I mean, I like the idea of Jonathan Kent taking over as the new Superman. I think it's interesting. I think it's a nice change without Mm -hmm. having to get rid of Clark. Clark's still there. He's just moving on to other things. So there, there's things like that that I that I find very interesting. The John Ridley, Jace Fox, uh, Batman stuff has been really, really interesting and well written. I mean, it's John Ridley, so of course, but mm-hmm. you know that stuff. So there's a lot of good things. The Joker book. Um, oh yeah. You know that there is good stuff. It's just, and the multiverse stuff that they're doing is huge and it's it does feel like it's pre-planned so i appreciate that it does feel like they have a a trajectory so at least there's that it's just it, i just feel like it's too soon let's let characters expand let things breathe let them build before we do another rewriting of everything how, how much of this do you think is from cha- taking what they were going to do with 5g and changing it real quickly to match infinite frontier Oh, it, it yeah, I think a lot of a lot of the issues that that they are having and a lot of that kind of stuff certainly comes from that last minute drop of of Didio and um, and the whole 5G plan and reworking it into something that's a little bit more interesting and cohesive. Mm-hmm. And again, 
that's well, hold fine. On. I have to stop you there. You say interesting and cohesive, but the way you described it sounds interesting, cohesive, anything. No, <laughs> no I, I guess I mean cohesive in the sense that it, it sounds like there is a plan in place. Oh, okay. Okay. All and right. things yeah. are worked out. Whereas the 5G, when they started talking about what 5G was, it that just sounded like another new 52 mm-hmm. where it wasn't cohesive and it was just, let's just do this. Mm. Whereas this is like, okay, let's try to get to what 5g was, but let's maybe try to do it a little bit more organically and let it unfold as opposed to forcing it. Mm. Okay. All right. But that's where we want to know from you. Are you reading the infinite frontier miniseries or are you reading any of the DC infinite frontier stuff? Head on over to any of our social media platforms. You know where we're at. We're on all of them. You can find us and let us know. Sweet Tooth, uh, what I'm going to talk about is the Netflix series, not the comic series. But just real quick, Sweet Tooth was a comic series. It was published by Vertigo. It went from September 2009 to August 2021. So a total of 46 issues. Yeah, right? Oh, yeah. Then, you know, they decided to make a series of it on Netflix, and uh, Robert Downey Jr. backed it. Like, he's a huge backer of this and a big supporter of it. Uh, they did launch the whole series like like Netflix does at once, so you could binge watch it. Most people, as soon as they started it, got at least six episodes in because it just draws you in so well. Like, one of the one of the main guys is Will Forte, but he's being serious. So you take that comedy, and all of a sudden you have him be real serious, and he's hiking through the woods, and it turns out to be like Yellowstone National Park. And he's got a baby with him. And you're like, well, this is kind of weird. But then the baby has antlers. So you're like, well, you know, I'm kind of in. And that's what the whole story is about is a post-apocalyptic world where all of a sudden babies are being born as hybrids. And there's another disease out there that's killing off humans. Hmm, Right. So it's like two sides of a coin. And the the, the story is about this, this, this kid named Gus, who's Will Forte's son. Um, and Will Forte trying to get him to adapt to the apocalypse. Like, hey, man, people aren't to be trusted. People are going to view you as weird. Uh, you can only trust us. Let's stick together. And, of course, the story goes from there. And every act, every, like, character that you involve, like, you just kind of start falling for. Even if they're the, even the bad guy. The bad guy is kind of, like, over the top, huge beard, military dictator guy. But you're kind of like, you know what? Like, I, I kind of like this guy. Even though, like, you, like, love to hate the guy. Mm. And then, like, the, the, the episodes... They go by in a heartbeat because I couldn't even tell you how long they are because all of a sudden I'm watching it. And I'm like, oh, I'm five episodes in. Oh, the series is over. Well, now I'm sad. But it did get picked up for season two, which is awesome. And the reason why they call the kid Sweet Tooth is because he loves candy. So if you're ever wondering, spoiler alert, that's why it's called Sweet Tooth. Because for a while, everyone's like, this is making any sense. Why is it called Sweet Tooth? Stick around, man. If you really <laughs> know, that's why. So like, just, the kid just, just loves candy. Just watch the first episode. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. It, and that's explained in the first episode. So, yeah. Will Forte can't uh, can't stay out of the post apocalyptic shows, can he? <laughs> I know, right? Like, yeah. Um, but like I said, this one he uh, like he plays it pretty serious for like ninety percent mm-hmm, of the time, mm-hmm, and yeah. I think he's got enough acting chops that he carries it. You know, Will Forte does an amazingly surprisingly great job in that role, right? Like you wouldn't expect it from because he's been in all kind yeah. of comedies or kind of goofy stuff, and then in this one he is like the very serious de- overprotective dad. Yeah. Who was like, I'll do anything to save my son. Yeah. And then um, there's a lot of like, I mean, at the time, like no name actors mm. that uh, were surprisingly very good. And mm-hmm. um, like you start like really like fall, fall in love with the character and they're not perfect characters, which is also appealing to the show. Yeah. Because even like the good guy who you're like, oh, awesome. He's a good guy. Really sketchy, bad past. Mm. Um, I personally love it. And I ask, I'm, I'm telling everybody like, hey, man, go check it out. It's totally worth a watch. So yeah, I don't want to say too, too much thing. and spoil it. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I'm, telling, I'm like, hey man, just go give it a shot. Like, even if you're not a fan of the comic book, uh, it is based off the comic book. But like, just forget about that. Watch it, and you'll fall in love with it. I read the first issue, first couple issues of the comic. Okay, how's it relate to the show? You you didn't, Smurfy. You haven't read it. No, I haven't. Like like okay. so, I wasn't even gonna watch the show. But on Netflix, they start out by having Robert Downey Jr. walk out and go, "I fully support the show, and I backed up my own personal money." Type thing, and you're mm-hmm. like, "Oh, like." That's like an interesting intro. So I was like, I'll give it a shot. And then I just start falling in love with it. Yeah. The, uh, the comic, I mean, it's the same concept, the, the plague and sweet tooth has yeah. the antlers. He's raised by his dad in Yellowstone and all that, but they're the glaring different. The differences are, are pretty glaring. Um, are they like big man? is yeah. nothing like he is in the show. 
in oh, the he's show. not like an ex football player. Well, he's an ex hockey player, which whatever. Oh, okay. Okay. But I mean, yeah, but the main difference is, is in the show, big man's kind of this big old lovable teddy bear. Right. In the comic, it's like he's Frank Castle. The B- big man, the best way to relate to a complicator is almost like Bishop. Like he's been branded. You don't know why. And then you he's kind of like hunting down hybrids. You're like, oh man, because you find out the hybrids are all being experimented on because they're trying to find a cure for the virus and they believe the hybrids are the source to it. So you're like, dude, this guy's bad. But then when he meets yeah. Sweet Tooth, he's kind of like, this kid's, you know, like he needs some help and I, I can help him. And so you're like, oh, you're like, God, he, he, and he just reminds me of Bishop through and through like the whole scar, the whole branded, you know. Um, yeah, I can see that. So that's, yeah, you know, like, so that's interesting. But yeah, in the comic, he's more like, like ruthless and brutal, like Punisher. He really? still takes on Sweet Tooth and, and, and protects him. But man, he is a hell of a lot more brutal in the comic. Because hmm. that there's that fight scene where he's super brutal, man. Like that yeah, one that's fight scene, nothing. Not see, okay, that's interesting because that fight scene is so brutal. Like he really tears some guys up with his bare hands. Interesting. Well, it's definitely it's on my my queue. I, it's yeah, one of yeah. the many things that I plan on watching eventually. Yeah. If you sit down, I'm telling you, give yourself like a couple hours free because all of a sudden after the first episode, you'll go, I have to watch the second episode. Yeah. All right. I said I end up watching it in two days. So I don't know. I thought to me it could have been twelve. I don't know. It felt like it sure. felt like two. Because <laughs> okay. when it was over, I was like, I want more. How is this over already? So <laughs> that's a sign of a good show. Yeah, and like, I mean, and like I said, like a very well done, uh, very well acted. All all the actors, even the kid. There's a lot of kid actors. All the kid actors are very good, and um, the special effects are very outstanding for being post apocalyptic. Because some of these, some of the hybrids. So it's really, like, I mean, this is a real quick summary too. So the hybrids, like, like this kid's name is Gus. The real kid's name is Gus. He just has antlers and he's got ears like a deer and he can hear, he can hear his like super hearing you find out. But for the most part, he looks like a normal kid except for the ears and the antlers. There's a few kids like that, but most of them who are hybrids look like, um, there's a kid who's pretty much a squirrel. He's like a three foot five squirrel. Yeah. Or oh, wow. uh, it's not a squirrel. Was he? He's like a groundhog. More like mutants from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. And that's what they look more look like. So this kid oh. Gus and a few others, they're like, oh, you're not as much of a hybrid as we thought. That's weird because like Gus can talk and communicate and all that stuff like a normal kid. These other hybrids act more like animals and can only say a few mm-hmm. words. So there's like the different you know levels of the hybrid, and they're all born that way, and no one can figure out why. Right, like they know what's got to deal with this like disease going around. Wow, that's interesting. Really good. Yeah, and then uh, a sign of the disease is they they grow a purple flower. So like these humans who live in these like communities where they're like, oh, we're safe and everything's fine. All of a sudden, in front of the, one of the neighbors' houses, these purple flowers start sprouting up, and that's when everyone goes. Uh, the flowers there. The flowers a sign of the disease. You have the disease, and they pretty much will raid the person's house looking for the disease. And if you have the slight like cold or sniffles, you're gone. You're gone to take care of you. Like they pretty much take you out, burn your house down, and then they never speak of it again. With you in it. Yeah, with you in it. Yeah, they oh. like cleanse the house. All right. All right. Yeah. Right. So it's like super interesting. Um, the one part that made me laugh is the the villain. You know, like the evil army guy. He kind of reminds me of Doctor Robotnik. <laughs> a little bit just because he wears like the glasses he's got like the huge beard and he's kind of kooky but like he's terrifying but like also not like the guy just does a very very good job of acting so yeah. like they really they really nailed the cast it's um the guy who plays the villain is the thinker from the flash show yes oh right. from the from the tv series oh yeah. yes all right yeah i definitely i i want to see it like like mr x says it's in my queue but um yeah now i know i definitely want to sit down and watch it so audience our, our listeners out there have you guys seen sweet tooth have you read the comic do you have any complaints or contrasts hit us up let us know your thoughts on it in a world where dragon is prime has not been a part of many of the current issues he has now arrived and he's going to talk about why the last man. So I'm going to bring to the current issues the why the last man comic. I recently received the absolute why the last man edition, and I've been rereading it again uh, in excitement for the new upcoming TV show. Why the last man is in my top three favorite comic book stories of all time. Wow. All right. I love me some saga. I love me some invincible, but I think I like why the last man more than any of those. Oh, so you put those are your, those are your three. You're putting it up so, with yeah. Saga and Invincible. Yeah. Okay, that's that's uh, high. Okay, that's high praise. And in fact, Brian K. Vaughn is my favorite comic writer. I guess author, comic writer. Yeah, same Whatever. thing. Brian K. Vaughn is my favorite comic writer. 
and why the last man is the book that i was introduced to him on and boy is it phenomenal um it takes place in again another post-apocalyptic future <laughs> um which actually it's not really a future so much as it is a post-apocalyptic now in this world there is some sort of virus that has escaped around and has killed every single living creature that has the y chromosome except for two yorick brown and his pet male monkey ampersand and yorick is uh yorick's a very fun swarmy uh, uh cocky star lord-esque character he he's also an escape artist which i found was an interesting twist because you don't see too many escape artists as a main character so yorick travels to washington dc where his mother is his mother is a representative uh in congress Okay, so this is a post-apocalyptic world, but his mother is still alive, and his mother is a member of Congress. Now, if you're saying that there's a member of Congress, does that then mean that that there is an organized government still in place in this world? There is. Um, in fact, one of the other sub-characters is the Secretary of Agriculture, who is now the president. Oh, okay. Who she doesn't want to be president. So there is a entire government still running um there's a whole story arc too where a bunch of the wives of the dead senators and representatives are demanding to have the seats of their husbands because they feel that one political party is trying to stage a coup since the majority of one political party, or well since the surviving members still in congress are majority from one political party so w- what is it that he is going to washington for then I mean, other than the other than the fact that his mother's there, he is originally going to Washington because he's trying to get to Australia, where oh. his girlfriend is. Oh, okay. Because it's a love story. In a, uh, in a way, yes. Okay. Uh, when his mother finds out he's still alive, she says, "No, you're going to find this doctor named Doctor Man, who is a leading uh, expert in cloning, and we're going to get the race back in control." Oh, okay. So it's about trying to get things back on track and then of course he goes uh he's put partnered up with this government agent um, named agent 355 they travel to a dr man while they're doing all this traveling trying to get the cloning things they're also being pursued by a group of uh special ops israeli soldiers this group of israeli soldiers are also trying to hunt him down and capture him But they haven't given out a reason why in the first 12 or so issues, which I'm going to assume will be roughly the first season of the show. Right. While all this is going on, he is also being chased by a group of radicals that are called the Daughters of the Amazons. And these are a group of women who feel that men all died because they were curses and they were horrible and mother nature wiped them all out zealots almost very much so um so much so that they mutilate their own body by removing their left breast so they can fire bows and arrows easier like real amazons did back in the ancient times so they are all trying to capture yorick who is obviously a very prized commodity right now they're technology wise. Are they using like assault rifles and like pistols, or just more like bow and arrows and swords? Yes. Okay. So all. Well, all. Yes. So so it's kind of like the Walking Dead world, where eventually they're just using whatever they can find and what's left over. There, it is exactly like the Walking Dead world because Got you. also there is no electricity or power anywhere. Okay. So yeah, Dubai. Oh. So it's just like okay. yeah, it's just like late Walking right. Dead, where they're like oh. just trying to survive and whatever's around they'll use. So. There, a fun little anecdote, Yorick meets this woman in the very fir- beginning of the first issue where she's uh, gathering up dead men and throwing them in a truck and taking them to, uh, I think, a stadium or something where they're going to incinerate them, where they're paying all of everybody in food. And she talks about how she used to be a, a supermodel and how that's kind of a useless job right now. Oh, hmm. sure. Makes sense. Sex, sex sells the men. If there's no men, sex isn't really selling. Right. How dare they exclude the LBGTQ community? Because it is still <laughs> wow. a very I big thing. I should have known that the pistol was going to go there. Yeah, Don't you judge me for championing I will judge rights. you. 
I'm a hero here. Something interesting about the Amazonians is they kill anyone who's had uh, female to male surgeries. Hmm. Because they are disfiguring oh. their bodies. Oh, oh, well, that's interesting. Yes, yeah, that's, that's that's quite topical. I'm wondering if they'll they'll include that on the show. I that's kind of what I'm concerned with is how much they're going to include and how much they're going to change with the show. Because, like I said, I'm such a huge fan of this comic. Um, I now own all three absolutes, and I am both excited and super nervous for what they're about to do with this show. <laughs> Almost like I was when they uh, brought out Invincible. Oh. Well, I know Thankfully, they've been trying to adapt this for uh, quite a while. Uh, it, it's, it's always been on the radar of uh, some studio wanting to do it for at least the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. It was one of the books. I, I can't remember how far I got into it. At least a good six, seven issues. Mm-hmm. I was borrowing them from somebody. And I was really enjoying it, but it was one of those points in times where it was like well i'm not buying anything new and as long as i get to borrow it from somebody great and then i again i can't remember who i was borrowing that from it was so long ago i am very interested in rereading the book and actually finishing finishing the story uh, and then comparing that to what they uh what they adapt on television because as we know it won't be a straight adaptation no they don't do that no I mean, look at Walking Dead. It was almost completely different from the book, in a sense, because of uh, Shane, too, how long he lived. Yes, but the the nice thing is that it still captured the core essence of right. what the book was. Yeah. yeah, if this does that, then I will be extremely pleased with the show. So that begs the question, have any of you read Why the Last Man? Are any of you excited for the new show? Let us know by going to our Facebook page or Instagram or even our YouTube page. We always look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. And now an obituary. Aw. Jonathan Hickman is leaving the X-Men. I was going to say, isn't this more of a celebration than, you know. So you will not be sending flowers. I'm Got not. It. No, no. Simply, simply because... I, I always knew he was never going to stay on the book. I mean, I, I, I had a feeling that eventually he was going to move on to something else once his big dream design story plan, whatever the hell you want to call it, came to fruition. I didn't realize it was going to be this quick and this muddled. Over the last handful of months, because of other writers doing other books, and explaining certain aspects of the new world order where mutants are concerned, I've actually been able to come to terms with a lot of the issues that I had introduced by Mr. Jonathan Hickman. And I feel like it was more the way that they were introduced. The fact is, hey, there's no preamble. This is how it is. And there was never any kind of lead up. It's just hey, so you were here, and you were enjoying this X-Men stuff, and then everything went away for a month, and when we came back, everything is completely different, and there's no explanation how. And trust me, I've reread Powers of Ten and House of X quite a few times, trying to decipher if there was any clue to where that change happened, and there isn't. There still isn't. But wait, because maybe, possibly, probably... Could be one day, somewhere, somehow, you no, too no, could just, learn just the X mutant language thing. No, they don't even talk about that anymore. Oh, good. I'm glad I wasted time trying to. They, that they've, out. they, they have glossed over a lot of the other things. A lot of the issues that I had, uh, and in this very podcast series of current issues, I've had problems with. Oh, okay, we're going to clone clone people. That that's fine. So death doesn't matter. Well, if death doesn't matter, does life matter then? What's the point? Where's the peril? And it took a very long time for them to finally introduce the concept of peril and mortality in an age where mutants don't have to be dead anymore if they die. It took too long to get to the things that needed to be addressed much sooner in this giant relaunch. That being said, I feel now, 
because of the article in which Hickman announced he was leaving, it stated very specifically that when Marvel approached him about doing all of this, he was like, all right, so sure, I'll do it. Da 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 da. Here's a five year plan. I've got this epic story I want to tell, and it's probably going to take us five years to get there. That's no longer the case anymore because we are still within three years, less than three years of Hickman having control of the mutants. And I'll, I'll reiterate anything he's not actually writing. I really like all of the, Hmm. I am picking up every single X book and I have only been disappointed with his X-Men run because he doesn't seem to get the characters right. And a handful of the other series, uh, like that Fallen Angels series, I was oh, like, yeah. that, that uh, was horrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was horrible, and all, all, all it did was lead to the Hellions, which uh, that was, I, uh, I, I hate the name of the book, but it's also one of my favorite books now. I did, I haven't gotten into the Hellions, but boy, that Fallen Angels was that Fallen was tough Angels to get was through. horrible. I'm liking what I'm seeing, but they keep complicating things. Ten of Swords was the 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 last big crossover, and it was an official crossover because it had the nice little banner, and that really didn't lead to anything except for the knowledge of oh well, if a mutant dies in other world, they don't get resurrected right. What? Why? Why can't you just use the previous download that Cerebro caught from earlier and resurrect them? And of yeah. course, nobody nobody talks about that uh, because that'd be too simple. But what have you? So we go through this whole story arc of introducing another island filled with mutants who are from Earth originally, and it's just this. It was this big muddled, added on story for Apocalypse in Sabanur has a secret history, and I, I'm just like I've. I own everything apocalypse wise. I own it. I've read it. None of this shit is there. None. There's nothing about him being into magic either. Mutant magic. No, no. But again, whatever. Moving on. Cause apocalypse <laughs> isn't even around anymore. He went to the other universe to be with his wife and his children. While the, uh, the, the mutants, the, the battle hardened mutants, and the other part of Krakoa, which is called Akaro, I believe I'm saying that wrong, came over. Good for him. He needed a vacation. Yeah, yeah. So he's <laughs> he's locked away somewhere doing his thing in this other dimension. And there's this there's there was hardly any time because it's like, okay, well, how are these battle hardened mutants who have known nothing but war going to interact with the human race and Krakoa and their way of doing things? And we just bypass that going like well we just stay away from them (laughs) and when they go off their island into the public the other mutants the x-men not but not x-men because there is no team yet go and get them off of the mainland and put them back it's like they came up with this concept and because and i have a feeling it's because hickman leaving they 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 rush through that they don't deal with that situation and and their solution is the Hellfire Gala, which was this big, it, you can't call it an event because it wasn't like, oh, for the next part of this event, read such and such. It was just in every single X book during that month, that issue was going to be a story that took place on Krakoa during the Hellfire Gala and the big events. And the big event is we're terraforming Mars. The mutants terraform Mars. And turn it, they claim Mars for themselves. Yes! Finally! And transport all of those mutants and that island to Mars. The other island. The Not other island, Krakoa, Akara. A, uh, right, yeah. Right. And and now, Mars is called Akaro. Okay, well, here's where I'm going to have to stop you, because this is all, this has all been predated way back when, when first... Magneto pulled a chunk from space and called it Asteroid M. M clearly stood for Mars. There it was. <laughs> Nailed it. Don't you feel like a silly goose? <laughs> Fucking asshole. Jesus, Hickman, you suck. Uh, 
simultaneously, there are now stories going on that kind of overlap each other, especially since this is the end, because now it is. The, the, it, it has been announced. Inferno. That story will be the end of Hickman's opus. Okay, but we're still dealing with the fallouts of the Hellfire Gala. Uh, you know, Earth, not all that jazzed that mutants took over Mars. But this is, some people don't care. But then there are other people that care. But then there was this big thing that happened in the final pages of the story that month. The Scarlet Witch is dead. <sighs> that happened in my book, too. She shows up. To Krakoa, her and Magneto actually reconcile. They reconcile to where he is no longer angry of her, you know, no more mutants, all that good jazz. She still wants to, uh, some somehow, the, she wants to show penance for what happened, even though she's not a mutant, she is a mutant, she's not a mutant, even though she's not really his daughter, she is his daughter, she's not his daughter. And Magneto says, you know what? We'll work this out. We will work through this. We will figure this out. And by the end of that issue, she's dead in a bush somewhere. That's how he figured it out. We don't know who's <laughs> killed Wanda. They suspect Magneto. Because there's also a miniseries going on called The Trial of Magneto. That's what the Good. trial is for. Yes. Good, I like he, it. I he, like it. He is being accused of killing Wanda and must pay for it. Now, here come here comes my problem because when you're looking at the solicitations, the trial of Magneto is still going to be going on when Inferno starts. And Inferno is all about everything that Hickman has been building to, the fact that no precogs have been allowed to be resurrected because of the big secret from the end of house of 10 and powers of x and, and further on into it that all, all this stuff with mystique and destiny it's all coming to a head but how can it come to a head if you're still uh, the publication thing that I, I, I it's more it's it has less to do with jonathan hickman and more to do with marvel itself i don't know what they're doing they're they're definitely putting out too many books Things aren't adding up, and when they do add up, they don't add up the right way because things are being pushed out before they should be pushed out. Uh -huh. Whether it's because things are late, or whether it's because they're scrambling to go, oh shit, we're losing our figurehead for this stuff, and we've got to we got to wrap this up so that the new person come in and work with what they've got with. Or, or there were other plans in place, and there were certain things that had to come to fruition or had to occur and it was taking too long or maybe things didn't go the way it was intended to. And now they've got to cram it in because there's like, didn't they just announce like eight different events coming in the next four months? Yeah. Or it has something to do with the MCU and they're going to do a different type of story of the mutants there. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I guess you could sum up your thoughts with no more Hickman. My call to the audience is, what have you liked about this iteration, this moment in time for the mutants? Because there's a lot of things that I could say that I liked. Let us know what you think. And that was our current issues. We hope you were entertained and informed by these points, thoughts, and comments until next time i am mr x i'm smurfy dr impact dragonus prime marv danger signing off What he means is you and everyone you know should subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on every app possible.
Also, I'm Smurfy, and I'm here too. Tee hee. Well, that'll that that'll work. That's where I can drop his if he shows up in time. <laughs> I'll just drop that right in there. I'm a Smurfy. Okay, there we go. We've got it. Great. Cool. I'm a Smurfy. Right. I'm a Smurfy. <laughs> it's me, a Smurfy. As an Italian, I take offense to that. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> As you should. Yeah, it's okay. Bipti bopti, bopti. Bipti bopti. It's um the guy who plays the villain is the thinker from the Flash show. Yes. Oh, from kidding. the from the TV series. Oh, yeah. yes. I just had his name up and I just forgot it. Let me find uh, it. Yeah, again. I forgot. Uh, I forget his Neil name. Neil. I like him. Sandalands. That sounds right. Yeah, that sounds about right. I think. I might be mispronouncing S- it. I can't pronounce Sandalins? words. Sandalands. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yep. Can't pronounce I can't pronounce words. words. Yeah. <laughs> like nope. I try. I do. I try. I do. I try, I do. I try, I do. I try, 